All right, so I am not taking a course in um, this stuff right now, but this is just one of like my favorite textbooks of all time. Um, it might have been one of the fa my favorite courses I took ever. Um, part of that might just have to do with the fact that it was like my first semester actually being a math major and starting to learn about all this stuff and um, really getting sort of um, excited about all the new stuff that I was learning about. So there could be a little bit of like nostalgia um, for me with this topic. But I think I think this textbook is really great. And so I basically just have a little bit of extra time on my hands. And so I decided I'd start going through some of these exercises. Um, one thing that I really like about these exercises is, um, and this textbook in general, is these topics are very visual because a lot of times what we're dealing with is real functions of one variable. So they just look like this here. We've got uh, the x-axis, r, right axis, we've got r. So we're just thinking about functions um, from the real line to the real line. So we can visualize them very easily. And so you can sort of picture in your head what's going on. And that also works for some of the like topology stuff that we'll be going over. You can think about these sets as just like sort of blobs and imagining what happens visually. Um, but anyways, uh, the other the other nice thing about this textbook is that you don't need really any background in order to get started on this. I mean, if you have a background in calculus, then some of the stuff that we get to in the calculus chapters, like with differentiation, there might be a lot of stuff that you've already seen before. But I don't really think you need to have seen it in order to understand what's going on. Nor do I think you really need to have ever taken a course in pure mathematics. So you could just come in here just without really knowing anything and uh, be able to learn like a very important part of pure mathematics. And so it's a really good starting point uh, to see like what mathematicians actually do. This will definitely give you a feel for like what sorts of questions mathematicians ask and how they think about problems and proving problems and writing proofs because of course up until this point you may not have even had to do any proofs in your courses. Um, but here everything we do is going to be proof based so um, that's really exciting. Anyways, enough introduction. Let's start with this problem. Um, this will take a little bit of time to uh, pick up in terms of uh, the style that I like. Um, for example, this exercise, this is interesting. It's a little more algebraic, though. Um, you can't really see what's happening. It's more just d working with the symbols and facts about rational numbers. So I guess rational numbers, you should know some background about them. So. I'll show you what we mean by that. So if R is rational and X is irrational, prove that the sum and product are both irrational. So let's see here. Um, let R be written as A divided by B. So if R is a rational number, that means that we can write it as A divided by B, where A and B are both integers. B is not zero and um, we can also assume that this way of writing R is completely reduced. Like, um, you know, if you reduce a fraction, like if you have 2 over 4, that's the same as 1 over 2 because um, 4 is the same as 2 times 2, and so you can cancel out the 2s here, and you just get 1 over 2. Um, similar, so for R here, we assume that A and B are co-prime, meaning that there's no you can't cancel anything out from them. So like for example, say two thirds, um, you can't cancel anything out. Um, uh, or you, if you have like six over five, sure you could write six is two times three, but you can't cancel any of these with the five. So we, we, we prove that R is irreducible. Again, sorry, sorry if this is a little bit like low level for what people are typically coming in what background people are coming into this with. Um, I'm, uh, it'll take me some time to get a feel for what kinds of things I should assume people reading this textbook should know, because it's been a while and I forget what I didn't know when I learned this. Um, but anyways, okay, 
So x is irrational. So we will assume for contradiction that our, and that's what AFC stands for, that R plus x is an element of the rational numbers, q. Then what does that mean? Then that means that we can write r plus x as a quotient, c of d, um, where of course c and d are in our integers. And of course we also have d is non-zero and c and d, um, this is a reduced fraction, uh, so on and so forth. But anyways, you take this equation here and you subtract r from both sides then we can write x as, well, we just have c over d minus r. And so this is c over d minus a over b. And we want to see if we can write, we want to get a contradiction. So we know that x is irrational. So if we can prove that x is rational, then we've got a contradiction. So what we do is, um, so here, just to be really explicit here, let's write this difference as a fraction if we can. And to do that, we need like denominators. So we take the first fraction and we write it as CB over DB. And the second one, we do AD over BD. And so then this is just CB minus AD over BD, which this is a fraction and both the numerator and denominator are integers. And so this is a rational number. And this contradicts the fact that X is not a rational number. And so therefore it cannot be so we assume for contradiction that r plus x is rational and we arrived at a contradiction. So therefore r plus x is not rational. Okay, so that's the first part. And we do a similar thing for r times x. Um, we assume for contradiction r times x is in q. Then we can write r times x as c over d for some integers c and d again. I, and just to note here, so when it comes to proofs, one, one thing that you really develop when you write about proofs is when you're looking at these variables, um, what each variable is doing and sort of what the scope of each variable is. And that's a big question in this textbook in general is, if we've got different variables, what is each variable doing? How are the variables related? Um, particularly when we start to talk about limits. So we'll, we'll be asking, okay, so if we're taking the limit of two variables, which limit are we taking first? How are those limits related? And um, those sort of subtle questions of what the variables are doing will become incredibly important in figuring out what the solutions to our questions are. But anyways, so the the point that I'm getting to is this C over D here, This these values C over D are completely different from the C over D that we had before. Um, so I'm basically just reusing these variable names even though they can represent different variables. Um, and so I might do that from time to time where I reuse a variable and it looks a little weird, like, wait, didn't you use that variable before? Doesn't that mean a, a different thing? Doesn't that mean what it meant before? And you sort of, with time, develop a sense of when are you resetting a variable and when are you reusing the same variable that you used before? Here we're resetting variables. We're just saying that there are some, that r times x can be written as a quotient of two integers. And we just happen to be in, happen to be using C and D for these integers and that it's completely independent of the C and D that we chose earlier. Anyways, so what can we do? Well, we could just multiply um, so what is our R? R is A over B, so A over B 
times x is c over d. So if we multiply both sides of this equation by b over a, then that will cancel with the a over b on the left side, and so we'll just get x is equal to c over d times b over a, and so this is cb over da, and this is a rational number. But again, this contradicts the fact that x is not in the rational numbers. And hence, because we assumed, we assumed this fact and arrived at a contradiction, and therefore this fact cannot be true, i.e. rx cannot be a rational number. Okay, so sorry if I took a lot of time to explain some of those details, but especially for, for, for starting out these exercises, I want to make sure that I'm being very clear about everything. And yeah, I'll probably get more efficient over time. And also, as I keep going through these exercises, I'll, ref I'll be able to like refer to previous exercises to see, oh, I went into more detail about this sort of topic earlier, so I don't need to do it again. Um, but yeah, that's how you that's how you prove um, that these two things are irrational, and we are now done.